Welcome back to Clipboard Electronics. Today I have the first video in a series about a retro computing platform that I'm building that will be able to use 6502 processors, 8080 processors, 8086s, so you can experiment and play around with those. One of the fundamental parts of such a computer is the clock module. So this is the clock module that I built and in this video I'm going to go over a little bit of the philosophy behind why I built it this way and then explain how the hardware works which is very simple. In the next video I will go over the software for this which works on the AT Tiny here through interrupts. So it's a little bit more complicated and I want to have that video just be about programming with interrupts on the AT Tiny. First of all, one of the design goals of this clock module is it needs to fit on half a breadboard. And I wanted that because I'm also going to have a power distribution module that is also going to fit on half a breadboard and it'll just save me some space and make everything work a little nicer together. I wanted this to be easy to build and easy to understand and I think using software for some of the functions here just makes things a little easier to understand. It certainly simplifies the hardware over using like 555 timers. It's not more simple than a crystal oscillator, but for a testing clock where you want to be able to single step and all that, this is a very simple design. Easy to understand, easy to replicate. I wanted this to be useful for multiple different computers. When you can reconfigure the software and change characteristics of the timing pulse just by software, that helps out with using some of the different processors that I plan to use. I think just going left to right is probably the best way. So I tied the two power rails together. That just makes things more convenient on a breadboard. I usually do that. This pin right here, which is pin number 8 of the AT-Tiny, is tied to VCC. So, positive there. This pin over here, which is pin 1, that's the reset pin. I have that tied high through a resistor. I have the ground pin for the AT-Tiny tied in there. And then everything else is signals. First thing here is the potentiometer for the speed control and that is just set up as a simple voltage divider and the signal for that goes over to pin 2 here of the AT Tiny. The step button is tied through the yellow wire here to pin 7 on the AT Tiny. The mode switch, I ended up using this dip switch because it's kind of all I had. I would like to have a bigger switch there, but this is what I had. But that runs through this gray wire over to pin 6 on the AT Tiny. This red wire here is the halt signal, which stops the clock if you're in auto mode and it causes the button to be ignored if you're in manual mode. Then the last thing here is the clock output itself, which is wired to all three of these rails on both sides. And the output for that is coming from pin 5 of the AT Tiny. Now just to demonstrate real quickly how this works, if you apply power here, it's in auto mode, so it starts blinking and this is the clock output then. And that is controlled by the potentiometer there, so you can slow it down. You can slow it down to about 1 hertz, and then you can speed it all the way up. And I don't know what the maximum speed is, but it looks like the LED is just on. So then, if you switch over into manual mode, you can single step the clock and that's just simply a debounce button so if you click it too fast 
you only get one clock pulse. And then you can stop the clock with the halt signal in auto mode as well. Now, I also built a more permanent version of this clock on a proto board here with a 3D printed case for it. And I did a couple of things differently here. I did not put a mode activator light because I think it's pretty obvious what mode you're in based on whether the clock is blinking. Uh, I used a big potentiometer, which I like. This thing is really smooth. And I brought the clock signal out with headers so that I can still plug into my breadboards. But as you can see here, it is controlling the 6502 processor just fine. And I've got the processor running through addresses here. So you can see that this clock will work. Now one interesting thing about this processor that I have is, as you can see here, it is actually a Rockwell 6502. And it's not the more modern static version of the 6502. So, there is a sort of minimum clock speed. And if you slow the clock down, if you try to single step the clock, it works as long as you keep going. But if you stop for too long, what will happen is the processor kind of winks out. And strangely enough, if you start pulsing the clock again, the processor will come back to life. And it's doing what it's supposed to be doing. So that kind of reinforces the point of using a software clock. As soon as I realized that I had that issue, I looked in the data sheet on how to fix it. And you need to be able to control the ready signal of the processor, which I currently just have tied to 5 volts. If I can control the ready signal though with my clock module with a simple rewiring here, then I will be able to single step this processor correctly. So that's another advantage of just doing things in software. Thanks for watching Clipboard Electronics. I hope you enjoyed this introduction to the 6502 computer project. If you like what you see here, please like and subscribe and you'll be notified of the next video in the series, which in this case is going to be the code for the clock module using interrupts on the ATtiny.